Oh, hello everyone to my talk about improving web application scanning. So about me first, uh, this is where I live. So I hope you all know POC or GTFO, the very famous hacker journal that comes out from time to time. But I don't live on page one, I live on page 95 and it's a very small place where I live. So we really have to zoom in. I live, I live right, right next to bigger key sizes. So we have to zoom in a little bit, a little bit closer, a little bit closer. Oh, there we can see it. Ah, Liechtenstein. That's where I'm from. So it's really, really small place. And what do I do there? Well, I play CTF with Cybersecurity Liechtenstein, um, where we have a team that goes to the European Cybersecurity Challenge every year and uh, I'm a technical trainer for them. I also participate with the DEF CON Switzerland Association that brings you Area 41, and I'm the organizer of Beer on Tuesday in Kur. So if you feel like having a beer once a month in Kur, please come by. And I also used to lecture information security at university, although I'm not doing that anymore for the moment. So this entire IT security thing and pen testing I've been doing it for more than 10 years, and three years ago I founded Pentagrid, uh, which is an IT security company focused on pen testing and security analysis, together with my co-founder, Martin Schobert, who does a lot of cool hardware hacks as well, but w one of my favorite ones was that when he wanted to exploit a VoIP telephone that shows um, phone book entries, he wanted the cross-site scripting payload in the phone book, um, so he tried to put it into the German uh, telecom phone book, but actually the exploit already triggered on the telephone book of German telecom instead of the VoIP phone he wanted to target. So um, yeah, that was just a coincidence. So at Pentagrid we do a te technically solid security assessment of IT systems for companies. We have two offices in Buch St. Gallen and Berlin, and we're four IT security analysts who do um, a lot of pen testing, and we have decades of experience in security analysis. Now, what I wanna talk to you about today, uh, the, the different topics. First of all, I wanna show you how I qualify to talk about this topic at all, because there will be a lot of opinions afterwards, and I want you to believe me. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the web application scanners on uh, what people use in our business. And then we're going to look at the different approaches you can go for web application security scanning. After that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think is wrong with that approach or how it's done. And then I'm going to present you a new burp extension I wrote to improve the situation at least a little bit in burp. Now, I think the best uh, the, the best argument why I'm qualified to talk about this is because I've been doing this for 10 years and I spent hundreds of hours doing web application security analysis. So I want to, of course, automate my workflow and therefore work on web application scanners. I did a couple of hacks that are public, so bug bounty programs are mainly good because you can show your things you did publicly. One of them was um, finding a TLS session race condition uh, in the TLS session resumption. And uh, I, I reported it to Twitter and they fixed it in 2016. Another thing that is more focused now really on web applications is a password reset code brute force vulnerability in AWS Cognito. AWS uh, Cognito is the user management part of AWS. So if you use user management and you want the service of AWS, you use Cognito. And we were able to um, attack this AWS service. And if our attack succeeded, we were able to change the password of users. So this was really a critical issue. I think um, it, uh, it was a little bit under the radar for many people because we just published it on our blog and that's it. We didn't do a lot of marketing or anything. So 10 years ago, um, I did my first web application 
scanner contribution, uh, which was an open source scanner back then, W3AF, maybe some, some of you still know that scanner. I think it's not used a lot anymore nowadays, but this was my first commit to web application scanners. And when we talk about scanners nowadays and in our business as a pen tester, you want to use mainly two tools. Uh, the reason is, as a pen tester, you need manual tools, you need stuff you can automate easily, but you also need an automated scanner. And the only tools that really provide that um, in total, or that at least 8% of pen testers are using, is either OVASP SAP or Burp Suite. However, you can't use the community edition of Burp Suite because the community edition doesn't have a scanner, so you have to resort to OVASP SAP if you don't want to buy a license. Now, if you buy a license and if you do this professionally, of course, then you have a Burp Pro license and it's really worth it and you also get a scanner with that. So I have to do a confession now. I would have loved to make this talk about these two products, but my experience really is roughly two days with OVASP SAP and more than 10 years with a Burp Suite. So it wouldn't have been a fair comparison and I would have probably said stuff about SAP that is not really true. So I looked quickly into SAP. It's a really cool project. It's open source and it's doing great and it's improving constantly and I should look more into it. But from here on, I'm sorry, I have to talk about Burp because that's where my experience lives. And um, yeah, it's hard enough to master one tool um, and really use that efficiently. Now, in, inside Burp, or for Burp, I did a lot of things. For example, I created the upload scanner extension uh, that is used by many people. It was voted into the top 10 of the best extensions by Portswigger. Portswigger is the company that creates uh, Burp. And I also gave a talk, no, not a talk, I gave a workshop four years ago at Area 41 here. Some of you might have attended um, about this extension that can be used whenever you have file uploads in web applications. Now, lately, I've been thinking a lot about this web application scanning business. And I actually saw that a lot of scanners, they just try to do their work, but they don't really tell the user when they can't. So for example, this is one very popular example or one very important example is if a client in a server use additional encryption inside the HTTP payload, so custom encryption, then of course the proxy that is in, in the middle, they don't see anything in clear text and they won't be able to scan anything useful. So what you have to do is really teach Burp how to decrypt that, and you can do that by using extensions, of course. So we created a couple of extensions. You can now just freely download and then um, teach Burp how the encryption works and how the de decryption works. And only then the scanner can really do its work because it understands the plain text instead of just seeing cipher text. The problem with Burp is sometimes it gets really complicated really quickly. This is just for this Burp extension I just talked about. Uh, we needed to figure out where to hook and how to hook and where you have to use the API and it wasn't easy to figure out. And a lot of people uh, wrote me and were happy that I actually published this picture in our blog post because it now makes clear where, where you have to do things when you want to do things inside Burp. So, um, yeah, Burp is really a beast nowadays and it gets big, uh, bigger and better. And, um, yeah, you can do a lot with extensions. Now, I've written a lot of uh, extensions. Apart from the upload scanner, I also did the response cluster. Maybe you know that one or the response overview, how it's called nowadays. Uh, I wrote an HP fuzzer, some POC exploits, and the transport encoding I just talked about. So that's roughly my experience. You see, 10 years of Burp um, makes you write a lot of extensions to have custom solutions. Now let's talk about general approaches for web security analysis. So, of course, we have different levels of automation. And on one side, we have manual testing. So you just take your browser and test things. Maybe use a proxy to repeat stuff. And on the other hand, you have fire and forget scanners. You just point to a URL and then they run. 
Now, the problem with that is um, neither of the uh, approaches are perfect, so you want something in between usually. And when we come from the left side, from the manual analysis, you can do different things. Of course, you could look at every scanner request and response that is sent by the automated scanner, but that takes a lot of time, so nobody really wants to do that. You can do anomaly detection, for example, with backslash powered scanner or error message checks or response overview. These are extensions that allow you to see anomalies and then act manually on it, on them, right? Uh, you get tools like SAP Fuzzer, Fuzzer and Burp Intruder. But um, what a lot of people do is they browse a website and then manually send requests they want to scan to the scanner. So that's from this side. If we look from, uh, no, there's also an, uh, another one, um, browse and automatically send to the scanner. That's the one we're going to look at today or one of them. So basically you tell Burp, I'm going to browse the website. Everything you see, please just scan it. Coming from the other side, um, what's very important is that you, you do a thorough configuration of your scanner. If you don't configure your scanner correctly, then it will probably not do what you think it should be doing. And there's also a very cool feature now that is called Live View of Crawl and Audit. So a scan is always, if an automated scan is divided into two um, steps. One is the crawling, so going through the entire website, and then auditing, which is sending different payloads and checking if there are security issues. Now, I wanted to show you a little bit how these things work, and I needed a demonstration target, right? So I randomly choose a target that I had prior experience with because I found um, a bug in Shopify. Shopify is basically a website which allows you to create an online shop and you have an, an administrative area. And this administrative area is the one we want to um, use for our, or for my demonstrations here. Um, I found a server side request for three ones there, but that's not really related to what we're doing today. Now, the first thing I want to show you is a live view of crawl and audit in a header browser. So what does it mean, header browser? Header browser means the browser is controlled by the scanner, but it still opens up the UI, and you can see everything it's doing. So it's clicking and doing stuff automated. And that's what we're going to look at now. Now, this is a video that took me one hour to record, and I cut it down to four minutes, so it's going to be really quick. Um, and you're going to see a little bit what the problems are. So let's start. And the first thing I do is logging into Shopify manually to just show you it's a regular login. So you go to Shopify.com. And the first problem we see is it's saying we have an unsupported browser. So for some reason, the website thinks we have an unsupported browser that is outdated, but it's not the case. For whatever reason, we just have to click a link, right? So we just logged into Shopify. This is my administrative area, and I can click some links, and I can look at it. So this is basically what we want to scan, the authenticated area. So what we do is we give the scanner the URL we want to test, and we configure the header browser so you can all see what the, what the crawler is doing. And of course, we also need to give it the username and password so it can log in to the Shopify administrative panel. Now we can configure all that. And you can see now Chrome is controlled by automated test software, but we already run in the first, into the first problem. Try using a browser that automatically updates. There is, this link is, is missing. We can't click or the scanner can't click, so it can't really log in. So I thought, well, okay, this was my first failed attempt. Let's scrap it. Let's start again. I thought maybe if I give it some more URLs, it will find the login itself and it will be able to somehow circumvent this error message. So let's try it again. So I gave it different URLs. I gave it the username and password again, and I tried again. Now, what did the scanner do? Well, it started to crawl the entire website and look at it in different languages and in French and in Japanese and this is not really what we want to do. We don't want to do security scanning, and this is probably not really helpful. So I stopped this one as well. I want to do an authenticated scan, right? So 
I thought, well, if you can't figure out the login itself, then let's prepare a login sequence. That's another method. So we can basically record a macro on how we log in. This is now, I'm now recording the macro um, of this login. And we can then, we get a script back. And the script we can just give to the scanner so the scanner knows how to apply the macro and then it's in the locked in area. So I stopped recording, I took the script, I configured the scanner again, and I gave it the script. This is the script for the login. And I started another scan. And of course, I forgot to configure the header browser. So I had to stop again. So this was my mistake now, right? I just did a wrong configuration. So I had to go in and, and do the entire thing again, reconfigure everything. Uh, takes a lot of time. Give it some more URLs. And again, it was not trying to log in, although I gave it the exact sequence, the macro sequence, how it should log in. Now, this is really frustrating. You can see um, I'm spending time on something I don't want to spend time on. I just want it to crawl. So I prepared another login sequence because I found out there's a second URL that also points to login. And I thought maybe I just give it that URL and then give it the username and password or uh, give it the macro and then it might be able to log in. So I tried that. And the next thing that happened was that it put in the email address, but the next button stayed grayed out. It's disabled. It can't click here. So the scanner actually figured out how to put in the email address, but then it wasn't able to click next. And therefore, it wasn't able to log in at all. So I just spent one hour of my precious security testing time to fail to run a scanner. And of course, I also made a lot of mistakes. I sent this video to Portswigger who do burp and they opened up uh, bug reports and they opened up feature requests and they explained to me that one of the features is coming, that it's gonna try to log in first. Um, that's coming in one of the next uh, versions, but you know, you can see where this leads. This scanning thing is not as easy, especially if you have the pen tester case and you have a different website to scan every week. Whereas if you scan the same website uh, every week, then maybe you figure it out once how it works and then you can just configure it. So I'm not saying this is all Burp's fault. This was also my fault, but um, it's, it's a thing I don't want to spend too much time on. And my theory is that, or my statement here is, Automated scanners fail for various reasons. And it's really a problem because it needs, they need time. They take time off my manual testing time. And therefore, um, we have to find a solution for this. Another thing I think is really wrong with these scanners is that I don't get enough feedback. So I have so many questions. What was going on? Uh, did it log in? I mean, apparently it didn't log in because I had the header browser. But if you wouldn't configure the header browser, then it would all do it in the background that you, and you would never figure out that it didn't log in, right? So I have so many questions. And one of the other big questions I have is, how should I spend the, man, um, the rest of my manual security testing time now? I mean, I just ran a scanner, or at least I, I tried. And it, even if it would have succeeded, I wouldn't know what I should look at now uh, in the next step manually. So I thought about how bad is the situation with this crawl and audit. And I asked on um, Twitter and 26 people replied. I asked, if you do manual security analysis with Burp Pro, do you use this feature? And nearly half of the people replied, they never use this feature. So something is clearly going wrong, at least if you believe this. Uh, 26 votes, but I also asked around a little bit here at the conference before I had my talk, and also nearly nobody's using this feature. So what else do we do as pen testers? We have to use a scanner somehow, right? So we can come from the other side and we can manually browse. So from now on, everything is manual browsing and then automatically send things to the scanner. So uh, tell Burp, please, everything that you see through the proxy, please scan it. And you can see here, I only had to condense a 3 minutes, 30 seconds video into 2 minutes and 30 seconds. So this is really 
close to real time. Again, we want to do the same thing. Um, what we do first is we go to the shop Shopify page again and we log in, this time manually. You can see the pace is already much slower. So we log in like we did before and Burp is not doing anything in the background yet. It's just seeing requests. It takes a while and we continue with the unsupported browser saying we have and then we're logged in. And now that we're logged in, we can add a new life task, it's called. And we choose the actively scan all in scope traffic through proxy. That's a predefined task. So we can say, okay, please scan everything you see. And this is what probably a lot of uh, pen testers are doing. We can also say, please ignore duplicate items because you don't want to scan the same thing over and over again just because it goes through the proxy. And then we get this task that says live audit from proxy. We can also see the details of this scan by looking at all the items it's gonna, it's gonna scan. And now I just change to the browser and you see it will already download a lot of JavaScript files and CSS files from the content delivery network. Now, if you ask me, um, JavaScript files and CSS files, on the content delivery network are not really the interesting targets of a security scan because they're mainly static content. And sure, you can scan them. There might be something wrong, but it's not a priority. And you can see when we browse the rest of the administrative page, we see more requests incoming that it's now going to scan. But the real problem is um, it's limited to a certain amount of threats it uses for scanning. So what is it actually scanning right now? It's, gonna, it's an important question you should be aware of. For now, it's just scanning the first 10 items of this list. And the first 10 items of this list are all static content from the content delivery network. So probably, you know, you can see more than 500 requests are sent per JavaScript content, and probably these are all not really helpful at all. So the message here is that nearly all smart approaches of the scanner are lost. You can imagine the first video I showed you was with a lot of logic from Portswigger. Um, they know how uh, requests interact with each other. They know when a session is lost. They know uh, if the server blocks you, then they can stop or maybe scan other parts. Um, and it's very clever back there but we don't get a, a lot of view into that. But um, here, the second approach is really stupid. It's mainly just scanning and just goes on scanning and it will never stop. Even if you just sent the first request and um, that was a 200 OK the first time you sent it from your browser, but then it just blocks you and you just get an error back and it will still send over 500 requests to that uh, or repeat it for 500 times. So the big question is, is there anything in between we can use? And there wasn't anything so far. You really had to resort to browse and manually send to the scanner. That's the only thing you could do so far. Um, but we want to do something else. So we can't really influence live view of crawl and audit in extensions. So we can't come from the automated side because well, the API just simply doesn't allow it. So what we have to do is come from the left side and do something like browse and pre-process the requests that are incoming, then send them to the scanner when useful. And the most important part for me was explain everything to the user. So if something is sent to the scanner, then tell the user that it was uh, scanned. If it's not scanned, tell why it wasn't scanned and so on. So I created a new burp extension called Pentagrid Scan Controller. And let's talk about this extension really quickly. So the extension design, uh, first of all, I wanted to have configurable exclusion lists. So we want to have the deduplication we saw with the scanner at first. We want to have, um, we want to scan interesting things and maybe be able to, um, 
say, don't scan uninteresting things and maybe do it in a later step. We want to enable and disable these exclusions. Maybe for every website, you need something different. And we want to also use some regex so we can just like exclude things we think is stupid for scanning. And we can do exactly that now in the extension. There's, um, this is the UI of the extension, and you get a full list of hard exclusion rules. So if you, for example, say, never scan get requests to uninteresting URL file extensions, then it will never scan get requests to uninteresting URL file extensions. And that means, well, what's interesting and what's uninteresting? So, of course, you can also define that in the UI. And um, I did a... Uh, a default list, of course. So, for example, interesting URL file extensions is everything that is active uh, on the server side, like PHP, JSP, ASP, and so on, that might be doing any logic on the server side. And uninteresting is static content like JavaScript or CSS and so on. And we have the same for status codes and uh, HTTP methods and so on, and you can all reconfigure this in the extension. So what else do we need? Um, we also want to be able to only scan repeatable requests. So you can imagine scanning is actually nothing else than repeating a request and putting into some injection and see if uh, anything happens. So if any security vulnerability um, can be shown. Now, the second step is if we find out that the request is not repeatable, we could try to make it repeatable, which is um, a new technique. I think uh, usually people make stuff repeatable manually, but I don't think there's uh, an automated tool yet that does it. So repeatability, uh, rep sorry, repeatability is, it's not only me who's saying that's important, it's also the Mastering Burp Suite Pro account who says, do not run an audit on endpoint you didn't check for repeatability first. So this is an important thing when doing scanning. But before we can just say, okay, we need repeatable requests, we have to define what repeatable means. And that's not as easy because the HTTP protocol, um, we can only really say if we need the same HTTP status code again. So if we send a request again, and the first, at first we get a 200 back, and then we send it again, we also want the 200 uh, coming back. If that is not the case, then probably the request is not repeatable. And everything else from here on is heuristics. And it's, uh, it's a little bit unfortunate, but uh, that's just what we have to work with. For example, we can check if the string status equals 200 is in the original response. And the same has to be true for the repeated response, right? Or we can do, if there is the string exception in the repeated response, well, that's only okay if it was also in the original response. And we can even go one step further and say, if the word expired is in the repeated response, well, maybe at some point stop trying to make this request repeatable because probably the session expired. And then there's another heuristic we can do, uh, which is really interesting that it works really well. So if the response size differs more than a certain percentage, then probably the request is also not repeatable. So again, I didn't want this to hard code it in the extension. You can define your own um, rules for what repeatability means, and you can do that in the UI. Now let's say we detected that a request is not repeatable. We, have, we can try to make it repeatable. How can we do that? Well, the most common case is a request, request value that is sent to the server uh, has to be unique. So you can imagine if you add a new user and you send a username for, for it to the server, then of course you can't just repeat that request because the username has to be unique. Otherwise the server will say, hey, you can't create another user with the same username. Now, how do we do that? We can change UUIDs, uh, email numbers, timestamps, and so on in the requests, and we can just stop trying to make a request repeatable after a certain amount. What else do we want? We want information, and we want to talk to the user, explain all the decisions, and also re rate requests by look interesting, because you just defined in the UI what, what you think is interesting, so why not uh, give you a rating so you can prioritize on what to do next? So I'm going to show you a video how to use the extension. 
Um, first of all, I'm locked in again, and the extension is not doing anything in the background because I haven't enabled it. Um, by default, it's disabled. Now we have to say, OK, please really uh, scan the request that goes through the proxy. And once we do it, we can see the list of requests going out, and it's going to start to test things. We have the same problem as we had before. We have to click the unsupported browser link. But we can also see now that the extension is in, I'm, I'm not scanning get uh, requests to uninteresting file extension CSS. A minus always means something bad happened and uh, uh, it doesn't want to do something. And plus means something good happened. It repeated the request five seconds after it got it. It was then detected that it was one-to-one -one repeatable because uh, we got a nice status code back and all the heuristics passed. So after 30 seconds, so there's, there are also delays you can configure, it sent it to the scanner, um, which was then scanning it. So we get all these reasons on the right side in the UI, so you can really decide on your own what you want to do. And when we check what's really sent to the scanner, we can see that no JavaScript and CSS files are sent to the scanner because the extension said, well, that's not interesting enough. Let's not do this. Now, let's look at the repeatability. We have gift cards here. We can add gift cards in our shop. And of course, gift cards have, have to be unique. The code has to be unique because we all only create one gift card code for each gift card. So let's specify one with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and a couple of Bs. And of course, if we activate this, um, this gift card is actually added to our online store and um, the request is sent through the extension. Now the problem is this request is not repeatable because, well, the code has to be unique. So the extension will check the request, will figure out that it is not one-to-one -one, uh, repeatable because it differs 37% in length, and then it started to do random char set mutations on the request and resend them, and at one point it found out that it got a good status code back again, and um, it started to scan it 30 seconds later. Now. How many requests were necessary to figure out the repeatability? Um, there's also a column for that. So it took 15 requests to figure out how it could be made repeatable. Now, 15 requests is not a lot, really. When we saw before, uh, it's better to spend 15 requests to make a request repeatable be uh, before we can actually scan it, because otherwise it will, won't do anything useful. Now let's look at the original request first. We see there's our code here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, B, 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 B. And if we look at the modified request, the extension created, we have some weird tags in there. So we have some random tags in here um, that basically tell burp or another burp extension, um, hackverter, to please replace all of this with a random value each time it is sent. And then the extension now knows, well, then the request is really repeatable. And this request with this strange tax, it's also sent to the scanner. So the scanner can do exactly the same thing. It doesn't have to care about those tags. It will just send them. And the hackverter ex extension is then going to um, replace them with random values. So now the scanner, whenever it is trying to inject something, it really creates a new gift card on the server. What we can also do is we can uh, sort by interesting score and scanned or not. And we can see in this example, the highest score that was not scanned were uninteresting gets to JPEG or PNG, uh, PNG files and uh, CSS and JavaScript. So we don't really have to care about these. And when we look, what was the most interesting request? Well, it was a request that had a lot of parameters in them and got a score of 549. And you can see there are a lot of uh, parameters. So of course, if you send a lot of information to the server, then it's more likely to be uh, to trigger something that could be broken or um, security issue. You can also hide all the items in your table if you don't want to see them, and you can start fresh from here on. So this looks all super easy, I know. Um, 
it's not rocket science what I did here, but uh, the problem is a little bit, we have a very old burp extension API. We're gonna get a new one, uh, hopefully in the second half of this year. Um, but let's see about that. And the problem was really, I had to do a lot of things uh, you, well, you wouldn't need to do if Burp would have a better API. For example, I re-implemented the entire JSON XML parameter injection. I had to do the multi-part injection. I implemented non-standard HTTP header and URL pass injection because Burp can't do that or couldn't do that uh, until now. I implemented parameter value type detection, so I need to figure out what type, kind of value is it. Um, of course, I ran into a combinatoric explosion problem, so changing all combinations of all parameter values um, makes, you, makes it necessary to use recursion. And then, uh, of course, threading was horrible as well, uh, because we want to do threading without delaying burp, so I used a blocking queue. And uh, we also need to check if Hackwerter is loaded at all, and the worst part of everything was Java Swing UI design. So this is really horrible. Although I wrote the extension in, uh, in Kotlin, which is much nicer to write than Java, but still you have to do the uh, Swing UI design. And of course, I had to work around a couple of API limitations. There's no project level uh, persistence for now, so you have to store it somewhere else. So the to take home message for you, um, first of all, your authenticated scanner might not be doing what you think it should be doing. I mean, you just saw the head of browser and we weren't satisfied with what it was doing. But until a year ago, there was no head of browser. So you would have needed to look at the requests in the logger and then figure out, was it able to log in or not? So yeah, this is not optimal. Um, so you really have to check if authenticated scanning is running uh, properly at all. Automated scanners fail. Yeah, that's obvious by now. Um, there is also no such thing as an automated pen test. If somebody tells you, well, we can automate all of this and we can pen test in an automated way, it's just not happening. Even with this tool, it improves the situation, but there is no such thing. You need manual analysis, otherwise your results will be poor. And I can also recommend to use this Pentagrid scan control extension. It's not yet on GitHub, but hopefully I can publish it tomorrow or something. Um, it improves on the automated scanning. So these repeatability checks, uh, they weren't here before. And I don't think um, the official crawl and audit is doing anything like that. Or maybe it is. I don't really know because there's not clear documentation about that. Um, and you get a lot of visibility and control of manual decisions you have to take while doing security analysis. So now if you would like, you can uh, follow us on Twitter on, the, on my personal account or our company account. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Toby. And I guess we have about five minutes for questions. Perfect. If you don't mind. And sure. if there are any questions, of course, um, we have Stefan in the back with the microphone, and I'll do my best to run down as well. So any questions? Any lovers of JavaScript? Maybe wrong question, right? Yeah. <clears throat> OK, there's a question up there. I got it. Hey, thanks for your talk, Toby. So apparently all the pen testers don't want to ask any questions, so here's Blue Team asking a question. Um, I attended a talk by uh, Simon Bennett from the SAP proxy last week, and he would, he would say that they're more and more focusing on automated scanning. Yeah. Uh, apparently you have only two days of experience with SAP, but could it be that you're riding the wrong horse? Run, running the wrong? The wrong horse. Because you're still trying to teach burp automatic scanning while all the automatic automation lovers have settled over to SAP. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, I think the automated scanning works really well in burp if you configure it once, right? So I think there are a lot of things you can change. And 
I can't really tell if it's better in SAP or not. Uh, I at least know a couple of issues I want to have fixed because, uh, before I really focus on SAP some more. But yes, definitely, you should check out SAP. It's a cool project. Um, but I think yeah, we're, most of us or a lot of us are stuck with mastering one tool. Perfect. Any other questions? And maybe while we wait for questions, Thomas, if you're in the room, as in the next speaker, uh, go and get your microphone. So, I if you don't have one question, question down there, yeah. all right. Don't get so easy off, Toby. Right. Sorry. No worries. I always have extra slides if there are no questions. Yeah. So this is just a general one. Um, you've mentioned that uh, fully automating uh, pen testing, in your view, will not be possible in the no. foreseeable future. What are the main bottlenecks you see there? I mean, there are some. If we narrow this down, there are some smaller areas, like, for instance, fuzzing, that I know out of experience can be fully automated. Uh, but then when you go to the wider domain of pen testing, probably you can share some insight with us. Uh, yeah, sure. So, I mean, you didn't, you did, I mean, people don't automate fuzzing for every software in the world at the same time, right? It's not, you can't just take any software, throw it into a fuzzer, and it just works. That's not how, how it works, right? And the same problem we have with web applications. <laughs> Too late. I mean, I, I was going to say that if you want to do fuzzing, you probably should target like specific. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, there's specifications like a specific protocol, or you need to narrow down enough for it to be fully automated, right? Yeah. I mean, automated scanning is great. Don't get me wrong. And you should do it, but. It won't replace your pen test. That what, that's what I'm saying. Because the intuition you get and the intuition, for example, that your scanner is doing absolutely nothing um, is, well, you can't automate that, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, run your scanners. Yes, please. That's good. But don't think you replace the pen test because of that. All right. We still got time for another question. Or your extra slides. Any takers on the question? Maybe not anymore. All right. In that case, you want to go for the slides or you want to get your applause, which you no, definitely no, deserve. No, 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 I go for one more slide. Okay. Please. So I ask myself, even myself, I ask myself, this Changing random parameters just work for to figure out repeatability. And then I remembered, yes, it works because the Swiss banking automated payment system, like it's a standard, it's called uh, EBIX. And it's probably how your company instructs your bank to pay your salary because it's an XML file that you send to your bank and then all the payments are done. And I remembered once I was doing a pen test at the bank and you had this upload possibility. And you uploaded an XML format, the Payne 001 format of Apex. And there's a message ID element in it. And all it took me to get a high risk finding was putting in this random tag into the message ID because you can't send two files with the same message ID because it will say, well, you already sent us this file. And all I did was I put in a random tag and then ran the burp scanner and I got XML entity injection. And this happened although like we weren't the first pen testers there, right? So I think we can really, with this extension, we can improve the situation because this extension would do this auto in an automated way. Perfect. I think that's now definitely deserving some applause. So give a warm welcome or goodbye. <laughs>